start as easy as it needs be. Okay. Thank you, Blaine, for inviting me. This has been a great visit so far. Really enjoyed meeting, meeting with all of you. Um, very cool. I haven't been on this campus before. It's really wonderful. So thank you. And one note, this is work done co-op with my postdoc, Barb Banbury, who's looking for a job. Um, so for, as biologists, we can look at nature and discover much about biological processes. Right? We can look at you know, predation. We can look at flight. We can look at movement and things like that. But once you add a tree, phylogenetic tree showing evolutionary relationships, you can find out so much more. Okay? We could look at um, timing of ancestors. You know, what, what did ancestors look like? When did they occur? Right? We can look at processes. What did, what, when did photosynthesis ar arise? Okay? We look at correlation of traits. You know, hair is correlated with milk production. Why is that? Right? We can look at timing of events. So we, here we have the KT extinction event. Right? What happened after that? How did, how did life change after that event? Okay? We can look at evolution of processes, like evolution of C4 and grasses. Okay? So we have all this data at the, at the present time, but by adding this tree, we can figure out all this stuff about processes through time. So it's very exciting. And not only I think that, right? If you look at growth of phylogenetics through time, at least phylogen star, right? And you see it shooting way up. Well, an interesting thing is that the overlap between phylogenetics and ecology and evolution is growing too. So at first, phylogenetics is just a little pimple on the side of evolution, right? And now it's growing and overlaps substantially with both evolution and ecology. Okay, it's becoming really, really important. And to understand questions using a phylogeny and using data, we need a method, right? So we have a tree, data, and a method. And the problem we have in phylogenetics is that we have some methods which are really useful, but development is very slow. <coughs> so for example, independent contrast is a famous me method for, effect for adjusting for an independent correlation of traits, OK? And it was in 1985. A related method to estimate rates of evolution occurred seven, la seven years later. Fourteen years later, some of us developed methods to have multiple rates of evolution, right? So here we have one rate parameter. Here we have two, right? Fourteen years to get a second parameter. You know, this is useful to use for lots of, lots of things, but fourteen years is a really long time to wait for adding another parameter. Another problem is that many of the methods we have are all basically reframing of the same method. We don't have a lot of new methods. So here are various questions. You know, for nucleotides, what's the tree? Or binary correlation, does raising cattle affect human inheritance patterns? Right? Covariation, does DNA swap between being on and being off? Okay, transitions, does forging on the ground to forging in tree crowns go through an intermediate form? Right? These seem like very, very different questions. But if you look underneath, you find they're all basically the same method. Okay? They use this, this discrete transition rate matrix. Okay? You don't have to understand what it means, but just sort of it's going from one thing to another thing. What they do is they vary what the things are. Are they A, G, T's, and C's, or are they, you know, on the ground tree trunk? Okay? But they're all basically the same approach. Okay? So it's useful, but it's still just one thing. For continuous characters, things like height or body size or gene expression level, we tend to use a multivariate normal. Okay? Um, and this is what this looks like. And a lot of people are familiar with univariate normal, just like the normal normal, right? And so you can look at the correlation that's between them, right? So the variance corresponds to this, mean corresponds to that. Okay, so you sort of understand what this means, right? We have many, many, many models that all use this basic multivariate. Okay? Classic Brownian motion, single rate of change, okay? And that has one of these and one of these. Multiple rate Brownian motion, that thing I helped develop that took 14 years to get the second parameter. You have a couple different rates, okay, which is just modifying this parameter. Okay? Multiple mean Ornstein Ullenbeck, you modify this and this. Okay? Um, multiple everything model, so something that we have coming out now, so we can have multiple means and attractors and things like that. Again, all it is is just tweaking what these values are. Okay? Very, very interesting model, very useful, but they're all in the same family. Why don't we try thinking about what you know? What other things we could, we could create? Okay. <coughs> and these all come back basically to Brownian motion and modifications of that. 
So what is Brownian motion? Well, Stephen Jay Gould famously described it as the drunkard's walk. Right? You have a drunk in the street, right? And he or she staggers one way, and then staggers another way, right? And then in our phylogenetic models, what happens is periodically he or she speciates, right? Which most drunkards don't do, but you know, it's, evolved, it's a revolved drunkard, right? They form two different species that now wiggle. But the weird thing with this model is they actually don't wiggle in the same space. Once you speciate, each one of you gets your own street where you, want, where you wiggle independently. Okay? And all, all, all our models are like this, where after a speciation event, species are completely independent of other species. Okay? We know it's not true. There are many situations where you can have roof-like cichlids, where they seem to diversify and do different things. Okay? Warblers on trees, some warblers feed near the, near the trunks, some war, war, warblers feed near the, near the tips. Okay? So we have species interacting all the time, but our models just can't deal with that. Okay? It's very hard to deal with. <coughs> so here are some of the models that are now hard to deal with currently. Okay? Bounded evolution. Right? Our drunkard wandering around, but can't get past a point. Okay? You can sort of deal with that if the, if the point is at zero, or you can have a single, single bound. If you have bounds on both sides, you have no methods for that. Character displacement. So species trying to move apart from each other. Okay, to new parts of phenotype space. No models for that. Mimicry. I want to look like that guy over there. And that guy's wobb wobbling around, and I have to wobble and follow him. Okay. We don't have those models. Um, effect of some varying external parameter. Okay. So the amount of UV radiation through time changes, say. And so mutation rate changes. It's very hard to model that right now. Okay. Some mixture of processes. Right? So normally we go like this way, and occasionally leap. Right? We don't have models to deal with that. So what our goal with our work is, is to allow empiricists to build and use their own models for comparative analysis. The idea is that empiricists know their data, know their question, know their, know, know their system. They can say, I think it's evolving in this way, so I want to test that. Right? So make, make it simple so they can actually go and do that, rather than sort of having to constrain their hypotheses into one of these two models of discrete with continuous trait evolution. That's the goal. <coughs> our approach for that is approximate Bayesian computation. And we didn't invent ABC. ABC has been used a fair bit in the past few years for various approaches, okay, including a lot in file geography. Um, it hasn't been used much in the comparative methods yet, and certainly not once people can develop their own models. Okay, so what is ABC? So normally, you know, with developing a model, you have a nice equation, you get the likelihood, maximize the likelihood, run with it, right? ABC works when you don't have an equation. So instead, say you have coins you're flipping. Okay. So doing coin flipping. So I could ask, what's the probability of heads for this coin? Well, we all know math here. So I'll say, ah, oh, just use that. Right? We can do this, and then we can get the likelihood equation and likelihood function, get the maximum, figure out the maximum. Right? If you're a Bayesian, you can stick your prior beliefs in there, flip it around, get a value. Okay? This is great. But if you don't know the equation, Okay. You do something else. And so for phylogenetics, what's happened is the reason we have these simple models, multivariate normal, or the, the transition model, is we can do the math. We can write the equation. Okay. We can tweak the equation and try playing with different parameters. It's all basically, basically the same equations. Okay. But there are many questions where making the equation is hard, right? or even impossible in some cases. So what's easier is simulation. So in this case, for example, we can say, well, let's let p equals 2. So let's carve our coin so it's biased in this way, and flip it a lot of times. And then you can see, how often do I see my observed data? Okay, I guess I observed it one tenth of the time. So the probability of the data under, my under, under this model is approximately one tenth. Why approximately? Well, I'm just doing a finite number of simulations. Right, so it's approximate. Okay. This actually gives me the probability of the data, the likelihood. How will this work? Well, let's do a coin flipping example, similar. So here I flip a coin 200 times, and here's the black is my true distribution, and red is my approximate Bayesian computation distribution. Okay? Not very good, right? If I do it uh, 2,000 times, a bit better. 20,000 times, pretty good. 200,000 times, not bad at all, right? So by doing this coin flipping, 
I can approximate this likelihood surface and stick into a Bayesian approach I want to. Now, of course, this has downsides, right? I mean, my thumb is very sore after flipping this many times. It takes a lot of time. If I just write an equation, boom, it's right there, right? But flipping 200,000 times to get the probability of heads of a coin is very slow. But if all you have is you know, this approach left to you, because you can't do the equation, it's not that bad. Plus, you know, 14 years to make a new equation, that's already pretty slow. You know, whereas computers are speeding up a lot over 14 years. And so you can, if you can make a simulation approach, it might be feasible. <coughs> How do we simulate in our case? Well, again, remember our focus is for empiricists. And so for empiricists, you can go like, okay, let's, let's, let's do a very simplest model, <coughs> rounding motion, right? Well, for that, continuous time is scary for you. Right? It's scary for me. It might be scary for you, but you know, better person than I am. Discrete time is not scary. Right? Where do I go in my next time step? I go where I am plus a little wiggle. Right? Next time step, a little wiggle. Okay? So this sort of little wiggle is pretty easy to modify. Right? You can say, okay, well, let's see if I have a, have a biased transition. Right? So I tend to wiggle bigger. How do you do that here? It's not really obvious to people. Right? How do you do it here? Change the mean. Change the mean to one, you always get a little bigger. So it's very easy for people to understand that. We hope. So again, we sort of split the tree into these discrete time chunks. Okay. Um, how do you choose the width of these chunks? Um, because if you're, if you're going to be assembling every single step, the more chunks you have, the slower it will take. Okay. Um, but the other thing you want to do is have the parameters mean something. So what we've been experimenting with is having each chunk represent one year of time or one generation. Which requires many, many chunks, so when your parameters mean something, how much do you increase in size every generation on average? So here's the actual functions we use. So we have a so this is all in R. I'll explain why in a little while. Um, but for your next state for a taxon, you know what, what are you going to be one generation from now? You're going to be where you are. Plus two functions: an intrinsic function and an extrinsic function. What do, what do these functions mean? So an intrinsic function affects uh, the evolution of a species independent of what everyone else, what everyone else is doing. Right? If I tend to get to go through time, that's my intrinsic function. Okay? Extrinsic is what you do based on what other people do too. Okay? If I want to move away from my neighbor because he's eating all the small seeds, not all the fluffy big seeds, right? then to make this trait, I'll move around. Okay? And so that's the cool innovation, that now you can actually have a species know what other species are doing. Okay. You can choose to have them displaced by their nearest neighbor, or you can have it based on the entire distribution. If you have many things on an island eating seeds, maybe what you want to do is move towards where there's fewer individuals eating the seeds, there's more of those seeds, that seed size. Okay, so that the entire island matters. Or if you care about just your nearest neighbor, you can just look at that nearest neighbor. Um, where the parameters you feed it, well, you make up your little model, and you can add your parameters. So you can make a Brownian motion model. You can make an Ornstein Illenbeck model. If you don't know what these mean, it's okay. You can make a minimum value. You can't get smaller than five or bigger than ten. You can put those in. Your current local state of the taxon. Where are you now? And then time from present. Okay. And that way, you, in your model, you can say, okay, if the time is less than a million years ago, you can get big because there's no more dinosaurs other than birds. But as before 65 million years ago, your maximum size is a lot smaller because dinosaurs are eating get too big. And we can actually test then for this model of did the presence of non avian dinosaurs keep mammals from getting big by just simply putting this in parameter and seeing, es estimating it. The extrinsic function, same thing, but also you can look at the states of the other taxa. I guess you can feel what the other taxa are doing around you. So how do we summarize? Well, so before we did our, you know, we exactly matched the probability of getting a string of heads, right? So you're going to simulate until we match the data. So one thing you can do is use the actual string. I simulate until I see the actual string. That gives me an estimate of how often that occurs. Instead, you could use proportion of heads, okay, as a summary of the data, a summary statistic, okay. Or you could use the result of the last flip, which is also a summary statistic, right? Some of these are better than others, right? This one and this one 
both contain all the information you need to estimate that parameter. They're what we call sufficient summary statistics. Okay. This one does not. It gives some information. But if I see that I have a, a tails at the end, then the probability of getting heads is less than one. Okay. So giving some information about the parameter, but not a whole lot. Okay. So what you ideally want to do is use summary statistics. Okay. Uh, su su sufficient summary statistics. Okay. And so in the discrete case, what you do is if my observed minus simulated equals zero, you get exactly the same result, it's a match. Right? I saw one tenth of the time I got exactly that string, it matched one tenth of the time, it's a match. The problem though is with continuous data. I'm looking at evolution of head size in my drunkard, you know, what counts as an exact match? Well, I mean, as you get better and better calipers, you know, you can always find you're a little bit off from the exact value. Right? So do something approximate. So what you do is if your observed value minus your simulated value for your summary stat is less than some epsilon, count as match. Okay, so there's another way it's approximate, right? You don't do a perfect match, you just do, eh, it's close enough, count that as a match. Okay. All right, so you want these sufficient summary stats, but in some cases, you don't know what they are, okay? Um, so if I tell you it's a binomial model, I can tell you what they are. If I tell you it's a model of property displacement with trying to leave, like move away from your neighbor, it's hard to know what those might be, right? Um, so, you know, here's our case, you know, and someone's making a model for evolution of these, we don't know what kind of model they're going to give us. Right? We don't know what's sufficient for that. And actually finding the sufficiency itself is a hard problem. Okay? So what do we do? We throw in the kitchen sink. Right? We say, OK, I don't know what the summary stats are going to be, but maybe one of these will be. So let's try all of them. Okay? And what are these? Some of these are for you know, assuming it was continuous time variant motion, let's estimate those rates. Let's estimate, let's just use the raw trait values. Let's use ancestral states. Let's use confidence intervals. Okay? All these things for different models might be, might be more suitable summary stats. So you calculate all of them for each analysis. And you'll see for some, some things, you know, they, they vary. So, for example, the root state. What's the ancestral state at the beginning of the tree? You know, your, what's it, how big is your ancestor in terms of head size? Right? Well, one summary stat is the raw mean. I just take all my observed taxa and just take the simple mean of those and say, what's the mean of that? And I look at, <coughs> you know, here's my true value, okay? And here for different simulations, here I simulated a root state of 30, here I simulated a root state of zero, here's one at 50. How far apart is the raw mean for my observed data from my simulated data? Okay. And see when I'm out here, it's pretty far apart. When I'm in here, it's pretty close, okay? So this gives me some information about my root state, okay? If all my taxa are near 10, around 10 for their mean, my root state is probably 10 under this model. Okay. And here is a sampling of some of our summary stats. Okay. And you can see some of them, like the rate of Brownian motion, okay, how fast you're wiggling, gives almost no information about what the root state is. Right? So this is a bit smeared. But the maximum value, or the estimated ancestral state, or the value of taxon 2, all give us some information about ancestral state. The problem is, for other parameters, different, pra different summary stats work best. Okay? So for the rate of wiggling for discrete time, how fast I move back and forth, you know, the continuous time model gives me a pre pretty good estimate. But my raw mean now gives very, very bad estimates. Okay? So it's the same model, just different parameters within the model, trying to figure out which one to use. Okay? And here you see it just for a couple of examples. And so what people would typically do with ABC, well, one approach with ABC is use partial linear least squares, okay, where you try to fit your observed parameter values and then your various summary values and see which ones map best. The problem with that, though, is this conflict. So you might actually pick raw mean because it works well for root state, but then it doesn't work well for a Brownian rate. And so what we do actually is do it PLS independently on each true parameter value, okay, using preliminary simulation. And that tells you, okay, these values work well for this parameter, these lines are well for this parameter. Okay, now continue running. Okay, what we do with our approach is we use Bayes' rule, right? So probably the parameter given data is probably the data divided by the parameter. Well, given the parameter, that times probably the parameter divided by some normalizing term, right? Well, now with the approximate approach, now we have this, right? So 
the probability of data given parameter is just how often do I get my data, or get something similar to, enough to my data, given that parameter value. Okay, so this is what we estimate empirically. How do you get the prior? Simple. You just sample your pr true value from the prior. Okay? And it's now your Bayesian approach. So there are a few different ways of doing ABC. The simplest, the one we use most, is rejection. Okay. It's like publishing. So you sample par parameters from prior distributions. Okay. You simulate data using those parameters. You do a summary of them. So you use the raw mean, use a different rate estimate, that sort of thing. If our summary is no worse than epsilon from our simulated, from our simulated data, keep that value. Okay? We're close enough to the match. Otherwise, throw it out. And the distribution of parameters saved that you know, match close enough gives, gives you the posterior probability of those parameters. Okay, here's an example. Okay. Here I have a parameter value. Here I have distance. Okay. Here's the true value, which you don't know. Okay. Got it. And you can see, okay, so these are far away. Ones around here are close. Okay. So you take the n closest ones, slice it, and that gives you a posterior probability. Okay, just the distribution of those. Okay, so it's super, super easy to do. Here's the same model, but with a different true value. You can see how the distribution shifts, right? From here to here, okay? Because now these points are closest to this value, okay? So it's a way of estimating, you know, very simply, this posterior probability. Now, remember also this is approximate, right? So you have this epsilon thing. So the bigger epsilon, the more smeary it is, the further up this line would be. Okay? And plus, our simulations are finite number simulations, which also gives some, some you know, approximate error, too. Okay? So this is so uncertain. Another approach is sequential Monte Carlo. Okay? This starts out the same way. You sample parameters, you simulate data, you do a summary of the data, you compare the summary of your data to the summary of, the, of your observed data. If it's good enough, you save that. Okay? So same step as the first. This is the same, same steps as the first, the same. This is what we showed before. But then what you do is take these and simulate from those. Okay? Um, <coughs> so you sample from particles based on their distance. Okay? In each generation, you drop epsilon. So you get pickier and pickier and pickier. Okay? And then you repeat for multiple, multiple generations. Okay? And then you use these save ones um, for your posterior probabilities. Okay? Why do this? Okay. So here's something showing how we're doing this. Okay? Here we go generation to generation. So at first we took all these, the black ones we sample and, and retain, and then over time we get close, get closer. Okay. Well imagine we had a uniform distribution, okay, something like body size. Okay. And my true body size is 10, 10 kilograms. Okay. I could spend a lot of time sampling way out in the tails my distribution, you know, up to a thousand kilograms. Okay. That's a lot of effort going into this area that's you know very far from your true values. Okay, why bother doing that? So the sequential Monte Carlo thing, what you do is sample coarsely and say, okay, where's the good parts? And say, okay, the good parts are over here near 10. And then you can sample more and more intensively near there and get a more precise estimate. That's what correcting for the bias occurred from you know, this, this winnowing in. Okay? That's what this approach does. And so, you, so note the increasing stringency. Okay? So here, circle size shows how far, how far away we are. Okay? So at first we set, like, this is even this big, right? But later on, even this is this smaller rejected. Okay, so we're getting pickier and pickier. Okay, and we sort of narrowed in on the true value. So you can see how these differences sort of decrease towards here. True value is up there. Okay. So that's supposed to be more efficient. So how does this work in practice? Okay, here we have for a 30 taxon tree, a very basic Bernoulli motion model. Okay, and here where is my prior? Pink is my, my posterior. My true value is blue, and my estimated value is red. The mean of that distribution is red. And so for the root state, we're actually doing pretty well. Right? So our, posterior, our credibility in field certainly includes the true parameter, right? and we're not that far away. Okay? And our Brownian rate also is fairly close, not perfect. Okay? And remember, this is without having to do any math. All you're doing is simulating a normal distribution. Okay? You can estimate all this. Here's a cool model for character displacement. Right? So until now, if you have things displacing each other, you can't do anything. Here you just say, okay, 
take your nearest neighbor, move away from him a little bit. And then what this is measuring is how, fa how much you're pushed away. Right? So if I'm really close, I'm pushed away more and you're further away. Okay? What's the strength of that parameter? So this is estimating that parameter. Okay? And <coughs> here's my prior. Okay? And here's my true value, blue, and my estimated value, red. So they're amazingly close. Okay? So they're pretty cool. And then we estimate this with real life data. So here's a NOLIS, looking at body length. So NOLIS lizards are famous for usually displacing each other. You have ones that live on the trunks of trees, one that lives on the crowns of trees, one that lives on the ground. They need to account for different body sizes and things like that. So we're saying, okay, <coughs> let's fit your displacement model. We find, okay, yes, we, fi we fit the displacement model, we find the displacement is three. Okay. Is that a lot or a little? So one way you can figure that out is by simulating just looking at it, right? So under estimated parameter vol volume, this would be a potential simulation, right? And so you see, okay, yeah, they're, they're definitely moving away from each other, but occasionally they do cross, okay? So the evidence, I mean, this is quite a lot of displacement, right? But they not, not so high that they can't cross each other. Because this gives you sort of a feel for what the parameter value is. Okay? If you had a model that had some actually biological parameters, you can estimate those. I'll show you the, that next. So here's a very cool paper looking at floral evolution and nectar spurs. Okay? And the basic story is you have um, white flowers that are hawk moth pollinated. Okay? Hawk moths are also like coming grits with their moths. Okay? They're white and point up, so hawk moths can come in and pollinate. Okay? Hummingbird ones point down or to the side, so hummingbirds can come in and get nectar. And bee ones are purplish and point to the side. Okay? So here's the basic idea. Um, and this paper had a hypothesis they wanted to test. Okay. And it has what's called a pollinator shift hypothesis. And I thought, why do these flowers have these really, really long spurs? I mean, if you look at them, I mean, that's quite a long. So the nectar is way at the bottom of that. Okay. Why have that? <coughs> and they had this idea of pollinator shift. Okay. So flowers have this nice coeval pollinator, and then some new pollinator comes in that has a much longer tongue, or proboscis, or whatever's using to get pollen. And then the flower can grow. And then what happens then is the pollinator doesn't get any pollen because it's way back here, right? The pollen comes from this little red dot. And so the select, strong selection for the flower to get a much longer nectar spur. Okay? And so they want to test this model. So basically, you have this trait, and then also you jump to get a bigger value. Okay, this is their basic model. And I'm going to be sort of trashing this paper a little bit. Not because, I, actually, this is a very good paper, a good example of how to do comparative methods, but this, they didn't have a method to test this exactly. So what did they do? They tested for other distinct peaks. So under the small, you should see a you know, hummingbird peak and a bumblebee peak. Right? So they did this test for peaks. And yes, it had three peaks, so that fit. Another, another basic underlying idea of this model is that evolution is punctuated. Right? You evolve, and all of a sudden, boom, you switch, and then same, same state again. Okay? Punctuated equilibrium. And so they tested them all for that. And Yes, the model that has changes only at speciation events fits better than a gradual one. Okay? So they concluded that this model was applying. And I agree. And based on the, the, based on the models they had, this is the best way to test it, and it's really convincing. But it's not, it's, not, it's, it's not complete. So for example, this punctuation model, what, this actually, what the model they actually use to test is at every speciation, you only change at speciation events, but at a speciation event, both species change. Right? Well, this model isn't both species changing. It's only one species changing. Right? And also, only about a, at a third of the speciation events could something have changed based on their tree. And their model assumes tree change at every speciation event. Okay, it's not this, this, so you know, this is consistent with the model they have, but it's not, it's not the model they were trying to test. Okay. Well, with our approach, just make, make the model and test it. Okay. <coughs> so we have two processes they used. One is a background process. Right? Just going around, your nectar spur length wiggles through time. Right, almost thing, and then the other process is occasionally you take a big jump, right? You get a new pollinator and get a sudden jump in nectar spur size. And this is their model, right? And then you have a frequency. You know, if you if you pick a random value and it's less than some value, use the, the regular process, and very rarely use the big jump process. Okay, so you can see, I mean, just you know, two normal two normal normal distributions, you know, sort of sample between one or the other. 
that's it. It's a very simple model. Many of you can, can write this you know, without any work at all. Okay. <coughs> and that's the entire model. The problem with this model is it has a lot of parameters. So the data only has about 30 taxa, and this model has many, many parameters. Right? It's a bad idea to try to fit a model that has too many parameters. So we'll just sort of fix some of them. So tree height, how old is a tree? We'll fix that at 300,000 generations. Okay? So <coughs> there are 3 million years for the whole radiation, 10-year generation time, so 300,000 generations. That means 300,000 time slices. Okay? This is nice because then our parameters come in terms of change per generation. Okay, how much wiggle do you do for generation? Root state, we fix the root state. That's the minimum square length. Okay. Our background rate for length. Okay. So how quickly do you, um, you know, wiggle back and forth on light and length? We get a little est estimate and then use an exponential based on that estimate. Variation displacements, when you do your big jumps, how much do they jump by? And assume we jump by a fixed amount. What is that amount? We estimate that, it's uniform. And how frequently do you shift when you do these big jumps? We'll have a prior for that too. Okay? The mean for that prior is based on looking at the observed distribution. Okay, seven shifts over the entire tree. Okay. How does it work? <coughs> so we get a nice tight peak for background rate. Okay? So this is remember the prior is the gray, and then red is our estimate. We don't know what the true value is here because it's empirical data, right? But match what we're expecting for empirical data. Okay, how much it would go each generation. <coughs> Here's the big parameter we care about, right? So in this polymer shift model, when you shift, you should get bigger. Right? You shouldn't be getting smaller. And so our, our prior allows us to get smaller or bigger, but our posterior is centered on bigger. So 77% of the weight is on a bigger shift. Okay. Which is, you know, suggestive. It's not, you're not getting a science paper out of it, right? But it's suggested that this model is working. You know, that, the, that your true model is this polymer shift model. Okay. And the interesting thing is the magnitude also seems to work well. Okay. So we're doing it on a log scale, and here we see the pollinator, the spur length on a log scale, and so we're consistent with a few shifts of length one on this log scale, right? Which is what we see for our parameter estimate. Okay. So again, it seems to be matching our data pretty well. How frequently do you shift? So according to this, you shift, you know, every 500,000 generations or so, you shift pollinators. Okay. It's cool, it's actually a biological parameter. How quickly do these, these populations experience pollinator shift? Okay. The problem with this, this, looks, this matches the prior very well. And so was it just really brilliant in making my prior? Or, you know, do I have no information in my data, and my data just return the prior? So it plays that a little bit by just changing the prior. Okay, make a flat prior, and you still sort of see this Followed at the left, but again, it's much more diffuse. Okay, so the, so the data that are giving us some information, we don't always get back just the prior. Okay, There's not a lot of information about pollinator shift rate. Right? So we've been working on this for a while. Here you can see us coding it through time um, as we develop more and more functions and things like that. <coughs> and originally it was me, and then we added a postdoc, and then Google funded a grad student to work with us too. So you'll see a grad student pop up too and start helping add. And you can see sort of bursts of activity before NSF grant deadlines. <coughs> and we wrote it in R. Why R? Well, R is slow, right? It's, it's interpreted language, so it can be slow. So that's not ideal for this sort of thing. But you can move slow parts into C or Fortran to speed them up, which we haven't done yet. But the good thing about R is we're you know, trying to deal with empiricists, right? And empiricists are now using R. There are books on how to use it. There are help threads. There is a task that describes all the methods in R for phylogenetics. Okay? And so if you're trying to actually use, use your method to actually get biology done, putting where people are and where people can use it makes a lot of sense. Okay, so. One thing in the method is it's Bayesian, so it requires priors. And we allow various kinds of priors so we can choose. Okay? One big question is runtime. Right? So if you're simulating you know, a 30 taxon tree, with steps, 200,000 steps all up the tree, that's a lot of little steps to simulate, right? So how well does it work? Well, here we see plots for a 50 taxon tree, 100 taxon tree, and 200 taxon tree with different amount of time slices per tree, okay? And you can see it can take, you know, 120 minutes for a 200 taxon tree with, 
you know, a million time slices, which isn't that bad, right? Um, but again, that's just for one simulation. You want to do many, many hundreds of simulations, okay? So this is a substantial amount of time to run things, okay? As so we're working on making it parallel, well, actually, now it does run in parallel. Let's boot that up. And also have checkpointing. So if you're doing analysis that runs for a month and someone kicks the cord on your computer, you don't have to restart it, you know, from, from the beginning. You can start from where you were. So you can work on that a little bit. Okay. But this is, I mean, this is still far, far slower than if you have a likelihood equation and you just say, what's the rate estimate? Boom, the rate estimate is 5.2. That happens in milliseconds, right? It doesn't happen in days to months. Okay, so if you can do math, do math. If you can't do math, you can do this. Okay. <coughs> so if you want to go look at it now, it's available on our forge. Um, you can look up the source code. Okay. Some of the things we've been adding to it, um, auto-tuning. So you can run a certain, so if we're doing the SMC approach, for the different generations, how many generations should you do? So try to tell it ahead of time so they have so it tunes it. So you can, so it can adjust itself and say, okay, I'm done. Um, my postdoc especially has been working on some of those plots you saw, which is those plotting. Um, also, we've created a menagerie of models, right? So you can write your own model. So it's much easier to just say, I'm going to take this model character displacement and just say, use character displacement model, right? So we've made a bunch of models for people to choose from, okay? It runs in, model, in parallel, and now it's not, not just the rejection model, now the SMC works in parallel too. Okay, future work. Right now, it's just multivariate. It's, it, it's univariate. You can only use a single continuous rate at a time. Right? And you do a lot with that. A lot of the things you're curious about are multiple traits. For example, if you want to see if there's character displacement, well, it might, you might want to care about where things are. So you want to have traits for latitude, longitude, and the trait you think is being displaced. Because if you're, you know, if there's nowhere near some other species, you're not going to be experiencing their displacement. Right? <coughs> so it's nice to have add multiple characters. We haven't done that yet. Discrete traits, we haven't done that yet either. Okay? That's a matter of getting different, different summary statistics. Model selection. So here's the big thing. Um, <coughs> um, with this ABC, it can be hard to choose between models. So doing like Akaike information criterion or Bayes factors or things like that, it can be hard to choose between models using ABC. Okay. And so we haven't really, and so that's still a very developing area within the ABC world. Okay. A lot of biologists want to do that. A lot of the papers you'll see say, I reject the Brownian motion and chose the other model. Okay. And to me, it's not as compelling as sort of saying, what are your parameter estimates? Are your parameter estimates interesting in a biological way? Because right? nothing's ever the simplest model. So you can sure you can reject it if you don't have data. It doesn't tell me anything. You know, is your parameter est estimate interesting? Right? So for those reasons, we haven't touched this yet, but we'll get into that in a while. And then we've been doing lots of testing. So the basic method was made was mostly, mostly about a year or two ago. But then we've been sort of testing to make sure it works and finding little errors and fixing that and testing it again. Because this sort of thing, you know, when people will go out and use this, to, use this for their you know, dissertation. Imagine being five years in and being told, oh, no, nope, sorry, it doesn't work. You know? So we have to make sure it really works well. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of this? Well, the advantage is Bayesian, right? So it makes you think about getting a distribution of estimates, a, dis you know, comp a credible interval, rather than a single point value. Okay? It's flexible. You can make your own model. It's somewhat robust to user behavior. Right? So especially if you do the, the automatic tuning thing, it will, keep, it will tell you to keep running. It will be like, okay, you've done five generations. Do you want to stop now? That's fine. And it will let you do that. It will indicate that you should do more. And unlike theoreticians, it gets faster through time. Okay. The disadvantage is Bayesian. Okay. I'm only sort of, I, I'm weakly Bayesian. I worry about injecting your priors into your analyses. So you know, we're doing it for this, but for other, things, other work I do, I use only likelihood. Right? So if you're worried about priors, worry a little bit about this. Right? Especially in the cases where, as you see, sometimes the priors matter a lot. Right, so it should be cautious. It's far, far slower than closed form solutions. So if you can find a closed form solution, do that instead. There's no checking right now for model feasibility. Right? So for example, if you have simple Brownian motion with a trend of increasing size, theoretically there's no information there about the, the, that, the strength of that trend. Right? All you do is shift the, the root state, the natural nat trend. So there's no way to, to actually estimate that parameter. So you'll always get the prior back if you're doing things properly. Right? The program won't tell you that, though. It'll just let it run happily for months and say, yep, got your prior back. So that's a problem. And there are also many more disadvantages still to discover. Okay, so still working on that. Acknowledgements. Um, so my collaborators with the Google Summer of Code, um, here's the grad student who's working on it. 
Um, so it's funny, so schools paying for this grad student in Nebraska to work on the code made in Tennessee, and he's being advised by someone in Arizona and someone in North Carolina. So we actually never see each other, which is nice talking to this guy. Uh, funding from University of Tennessee, iPlant, and Google. Thank you. Can, or you can use something like, like almost like the re, uh, reversible jump and the reversible speed test kind of use both of those models and then see that each step which one matches better. Um, the problem with that apparently based on some literature is that depending on your epsilon value, um, how picky you are about which ones match, it can change how far apart the models are. And so you can by so you can you know, make it harder to, to, to differentiate. Yeah. So is there any research Yeah, there's no. Yeah, no. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I mean, ideally, you want it as small as possible because that gives you the best approximation. So you have to do that or make, make sure you do notification. Right? So, um, yeah, there's no real work on that yet. I and mean, one thing we've been doing in other work is some model adequacy. So, seeing, okay, here's your model that you think is true. Now, let's see if it adds the data you simulate under your model feels like your real data. So, very similar to ABC in approach. And so, you can use their different similar summary stats and say, yep. With this epsilon, we tend to get the right the data that looks the right way. Um, or you could do um, through simulation on your data set, figure out you know, what sort of uncertainty do you get in your true parent. You know, you know what the true model is, simulate, see how, how good your estimates are with these size of epsilon. Um, the advantage of the, of, the, of the rejection approach is you just simulate lots and lots of times, and then you have all this pool of, of samples. And then later, you can change your epsilon and say, I get the same answer if I had an epsilon of 0.1, or 0.01, or 0.001. With SMC approach, though, epsilon changes through time, so you can't go back in time and change what the epsilon was. So. Yeah. <coughs> no, right now we're just doing just, just the, the, the true, true trees. It's going to be hard to do that, but in the same way that you can use space or a computational neighbor, you could add a model where you say, you know, I mean, basically, if, if you think that you're just straight and you're not really confused, you can say, okay, occasionally, you know, take your nearest neighbor and move towards them because it's easy. You could do that. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's, uh, what it's called? Yeah, let me, let me go back and see. Hang on. He has an open source tool, uh, GORSE, G-O-U-R-C-E. So you could even, if you have like a genetic model, and so you say how big are you to go on the genome of your own parent or a parent to your relative, you could do that. So what we did was say, okay, what is in particular about you? They say, this person is really like this, or this person is like this. And so you can say, okay, what's the half, what's the half this person? You know, what is this? Is it just half leg, or is it half leg? And so it was meant to be, basically, it's a, it's not a, it's not a, Do I then go through the genes of your nullus to confirm that the person that is this is actually me? Well, you just say too much. Yeah, it's a good question. And one thing that I worry about with all this stuff is that all the experiments that you get, you know, you might get enough genes in there. Right? So it's like taking into consideration that there's no genes in there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Other questions? 